welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about a pig who broke some therapy dog barriers, a headless chicken who lived for 18 months, and a raven who drove Edgar Allan Poe to the brink of insanity. Let's go! Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I mean, it's back for me because I took some time off throughout the entire month of December from recording, and everything up until this episode had been recorded prior to holiday break, prior to your winter break. And you might have even noticed with the Horseshoe Crab episode that aired last week that we were talking about how horseshoe crabs, if we get a vaccine, and from the time that I had recorded that episode to when you heard it in your ear holes, we have a vaccine for COVID. So don't forget to like thank a horseshoe crab this week for what they have done for science. And now think about the things that you can do to help the horseshoe crab. So I'm sitting in my closet. I think I'm out of practice, um, sitting in a dark room by myself, pretending like I'm talking to an audience. It's a really weird feeling, and I encourage you all to try it. Um, it you have to override every feeling of like, talking in hushed tones in a closet so no one can hear you to pretending you're actually talking to a human being so it's a listenable experience. (laughs) So go ahead, get in a closet and give it a shot. But today what we're going to talk about, we are going to talk about the king of creep, Edgar Allan Poe, the father of the macabre short story, and how a raven, the raven that rocketed him to fame, ended up being potentially a catalyst for his early death and demise. And I cannot wait because these stories make me so excited, but maybe a little less excited today because again, I am sitting in a dark closet by myself talking to no one. I mean, presently talking to no one. When you hear it, I'm talking to however many tens of you that are listening. But <laughs> but for the most part, it, it's weird. And, and I wonder how I'm going to feel talking about scary stories in the dark while I'm sitting telling a story about a guy who died in the dark. So we'll see. We're going to talk about a couple of other stories too. And we're going to start with a pig who dreams of flying. There's a saying when pigs fly, which generally means you can do this thing when pigs fly. I heard that a lot when I was asking for a pony as a small kid. But pigs never flew, and I never got that pony. However, there is a movement on the whole pigs flying thing, and it's up to Lilu the pig to start breaking that therapy dog glass ceiling. You see, Lilu is the first ever working pig in the WAG Brigade, a program usually reserved for therapy dogs to help bring comfort to travelers in San Francisco's airport. But not being canine would not stop Lilu. She's determined. She's confident. She's really bringing home the bacon. (laughs) She's not just the first therapy pig in San Francisco. She's the first worldwide airport therapy pig. She wears a pilot's cap and paints her hooves. Well, someone else obviously paints them. Paints them red. She's trained to raise her hoof to say hello. She can play the piano, though I'm not sure what songs are in her repertoire. And as any therapy pet has to learn on day one on the job, how to pose effectively for selfies, and Lilu's instagame is strong. Kids squeal with delight, and she doesn't hog the spotlight. She's a professional. So while she's not traveling on the planes yet, she is taking a hoof in the right direction. But maybe, someday, pigs will fly. Quoth the raven, nevermore. This is part of a famous poem by Master of Creepy, Edgar Allan Poe. But this poem was inspired by another famous writer of the time's pet raven, Grip. Grip was owned by Charles Dickens. You might know him as the guy who wrote A Christmas Carol with Tiny Tim and Scrooge, and the talkative intelligent bird made an appearance in Charles Dickens' less-known work, Barnaby Ridge. After reading the book as a literary critic, Edgar Allan Poe's critique of Charles Dickens' book, Barnaby Ridge, is that the bird wasn't used more. So, Edgar Allan Poe just took it. 
Edgar Allan Poe wrote the poem The Raven, which featured a raven who knocks on the door of a man who is grieving after his beloved Lenore had died. The raven can talk, but only can say one word, nevermore, which to me, reading the poem and imagining a man talking to a raven and watching him descend into madness and getting more and more frustrated that he can only say nevermore instead of, oh, holy cow, a talking bird in Baltimore? That does kind of make me giggle. People were not stupid, and they realized the poem that had become one of the most famous poems in history was essentially Edgar Allan Poe taking this concept from a book that he reviewed from Mr. Christmas Miracle himself, Charles freaking Dickens. <laughs> That takes some serious nutcrackers. People would just shout out to Poe on the street, yo, the raven, or chant because they could do some serious shade before TikTok was a thing, quote, here comes Poe with his raven like Barnaby Rudge, three-fifths of him genius, two-fifths sheer fudge. Essentially, this was old-timey insulting for, hey, you're super smart, dude, but we know you totes stole this idea. And while he eventually became famous and is widely considered to be the father of the American short story and all things mystery, macabre, dark, and spooky, he did not make money on his work in this lifetime. Edgar Allan Poe is frequently noted as the first American author to try to make his living with only writing. And not much has changed, really, since the 1800s. Most authors cannot survive on writing alone. Can relate. But for a man that we look back at and say, wow, that guy must have everything, he really didn't. Edgar Allan Poe was never really financially secure, and by all accounts, he really struggled despite writing as much as he did. I'm wondering if the ghost of Grip the Raven came back to get Poe, a la the grieving lover in the Raven. You see, the end of Edgar Allan Poe's life actually sounds a whole lot like one of the stories that he would have come up with. Edgar Allan Poe was found by a man named Joseph Walker, who brought Poe to the hospital in need of immediate assistance. Poe was found wandering deliriously on the streets of Baltimore. He certainly was not the last to do so. In a mystery fitting for Poe himself, he was wearing someone else's clothing, kept calling out the name Reynolds the night before his death, which I imagine in a nevermore manner. Doctors asking, how are you feeling? Reynolds! Whose clothes are these? Reynolds. Do you like Jello, Mr. Poe? Reynolds. And if you've seen Hamilton, you might have feelings about the name Reynolds. Ugh, that guy. He never became lucid enough to say exactly how he got in the state he was in, but he died days later at a hospital. After Edgar Allan Poe died, all of his medical records and his death certificate just up and disappeared. It's theorized that Poe died either of alcoholism, which at the time they would have called it cerebral inflammation or congestion of the brain, epilepsy, cholera, rabies, don't pet wildlife kids, or syphilis, which according to Ranker.com, this beast of a bacteria, syphilis, has taken out other historical figures too, like Christopher Columbus, who brought it to the New World and killed millions of native people who were not able to fight the bacteria. Noted gangster Al Capone killed upwards of 400 people, either directly or indirectly, and he was felled by advanced syphilis while at Alcatraz prison. Oscar Wilde, another writer who very likely had syphilis, but also had died from the treatment. Mercury, of which he had so many mercury treatments, his teeth famously turned black and he covered his mouth anytime he spoke. Oh, and good old Honest Abe. President Lincoln himself was not unfamiliar with traveling the country to see the sights and meet some new friends. Very likely passed this disease on to his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, who in her last days famously descended into what they called hysteria, which is honestly just code for woman who wasn't behaving in a socially ladylike manner. And that could span quite a spread of behaviors, including things like wanting to vote or saying no to your husband. By all accounts, most women of today would be considered hysterical. <coughs> However, her hysteria was well documented. And while it's often suggested that she started to go downhill after her husband was brutally murdered by gunshot while they were at the theater while she sat next to him, which would 
absolutely make anyone need to seek out some psychological assistance. What makes experts consider syphilis was the knife-like pain in her back, dementia, impaired coordination, blindness, and weight loss. All of these are symptoms of advanced syphilis, which President Lincoln, had he not been shot in the skull, might have suffered from as well. And since only his brain was autopsied, because, you know, it was the 1800s and it was pretty clear that that was the cause of his death, they never looked anywhere else in his body. So it's unclear if the syphilis had progressed as he had admitted to contracting the disease in 1835 to his law partner at the time. But at the time, 15% of everyone had syphilis. It was basically as American as apple pie. So when you're the granddaddy of Grimm and your death certificate ends up missing, it certainly adds to the entire aura of how people think about you going forward. So let's go back to Grip. Grip the raven, preserved with arsenic, which we know is a poison, but at the time was used for everything. A preservation chemical for dead animals. Does a medicine to treat skin blemishes, pimples, moles, ulcers, and <gasps> syphilis. That's some circle of life stuff right there, kids. It was also a preferred murder weapon by spiking coffee with it or putting it in food as it's odorless and tasteless. And now, after searching for all of this, I'm confident I am on a list. So if next week's episode doesn't drop on time, now you know why. Who knows, maybe Poe had contracted syphilis and tried to do some self-treatment and just overdid it. Or he had other things going on. I'm certainly not going to armchair quarterback his death. People have been trying for nearly 175 years. I'm confident there is a Reddit for this if you want to go to Wacky Theory Town. But back to Grip. Grip the Raven died in 1841. And according to his owner, Charles Dickens, remember that guy? Apparently, Grip had some famous last words glorified and probably exaggerated by Dickens himself. Quote, On the clock striking twelve, he exclaimed, Hello, old girl, his favorite expression, and died. Making me wonder if Grip was the original Hollaback girl. And when he did, Charles Dickens had him stuffed, preserved with arsenic, again, poison, and mounted into a shadow box that you can still see today. Colonel Richard Gimble purchased the ex-raven who had ceased to live at an auction as he was a huge fan of all things Poe. And here's the thing that gets me. Poe never even owned this bird and probably never even met the thing. And it's so connected to Edgar Allan Poe despite being Charles Dickens' bird. And Dickens gets the shaft again. In 1971, Colonel Gimble's collection of all things Edgar Allan Poe and the smaller collection of all things Poe that were once actually Charles Dickens was donated to the Free Library in Philadelphia where Grip is just chilling out in the rare book department on the third floor. Gimble was a serious collector, despite my jokes here. You can see the only known copy of The Raven and the first edition copies of all of Edgar Allan Poe's works in Philadelphia. Grip the Raven, who inspired the famous poem The Raven, has inspired other works too, including the name of the NFL football team, the Baltimore Ravens, after Edgar Allan Poe, who was buried there. An episode of The Simpsons, which now you know you've made it. Several gothic rock bands. An episode of Mama's Family. An episode of Alton Eats. A cooking show where a plastic chicken replaced the famous raven, and instead of saying, nevermore, he repetitively states, fry some more. And my absolute favorite, quoth the raven. Get it? The bird is named Quoth, and he's a raven, in Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. So if you go see Grip, just don't touch the bird. Seriously, it's poison and a relic and stuff, but it might totally kill you. Which is, honestly, probably what Poe wanted. Farmer Olson was a farmer of the 1940s. Farmer Olson was hungry, and he did what farmers in the 40s did. He grabbed Mike, a chicken, and chopped off his head like it was any old day on the farm. But unlike most days on the farm, this chicken, after having his head cut off, didn't die. He instead tried to use his head stub to peck for food. How is this possible? 
Well, because when Farmer Olson chopped off Mike the chicken's head, he instead cut it above the brainstem. So all of Mike's functions, despite not having any of his face, worked perfectly fine. The axe missed the jugular vein, and a clot kept Mike from bleeding to death. Most of Mike's head was severed from his body. But because the brainstem controls most basic functions, like breathing and your heart beating, stuff like that, Mike was able to live as any headed chicken. Though he did need a lot of help. The chicken was able to walk, though awkwardly, and all of his instinctive behaviors were left intact. He tried to preen, which didn't work because he didn't have a beak. He tried to peck for food, which also didn't work because he didn't have a beak. And he tried to balance on a perch, which was probably hard as he didn't have eyes. Feeling terribly, Farmer Olson probably went back to make a salad and become a vegetarian after this. He decided instead of killing Mike again, he instead took care of him. Farmer Olson fed Mike a mixture of milk and water via an eyedropper, and he gave him small grains of corn and worms into his exposed esophageal tube. Mike went on to live for another 18 months. Without a head, that's a year and a half. Mike even gained six pounds and went on tour. So six pounds for a chicken? That's a lot of weight for a chicken, especially one who can't eat on his own, to actually be able to, to do comfortably. This would have been the most obese chicken I've ever seen. Mike was the 1940s version of the animals that you see today on YouTube doing amazing feats. He was a celebrity of his day. In fact, Mike went on to bring in a monthly average as a sideshow act or via celebrity appearances that was equal to $51,000 a month in 2019 numbers. A month. Mike didn't die from exposure or any of the reason that you would think a headless chicken would die which I would have thought immediately and because he had no head. No, Mike died like many celebrities in a hotel room. But he died as he lived, eating. Mike had somehow gotten a piece of corn stuck in his exposed windpipe in a hotel room as he was on tour. The exposed windpipe was exposed because he didn't have a head. R.I.P. Mike the Headless Chicken the only chicken that James Bond probably would have had some mad respect for, as they both had the same creed, you only die twice. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilderbeasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, other animals who survive without heads, Animals who help humans or other wacky animals in the news, please send them in to bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, author of Considerations for the City Dog, a book I have not survived on without additional income, so hat tip to the OG Edgar Allan Poe. Hashtag goals co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club and creator of Mud Stuff Media. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Ranker.com, historical figures with syphilis, ushistory.org, Atlas Obscura on Grip the Raven, wikipedia.org on both Charles Dickens and allusions to Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, Lilu underscore SFPig on Instagram, Reuters.com, YouTube.com on Mike the Headless Chicken a la Josh of Josh and Chuck fame via Stuff You Should Know, another podcast that you should know, and Wikipedia on Mike the Headless Chicken. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. It's the best way to get the word out about podcasts that you like. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week. Bye.